Am I tilted? Is it tilted? Can I? Mm. You can't tell, can you? You can't tell. It's close. Hey there, Cousin here, and welcome back to Always Doing. My September has gotten off to an amazing start. I have already read nine books this month. I will probably finish one, if not two more, by the time between filming this and it coming out. Like, it's been blockbuster, so much wonderful stuff, mostly good to amazing. I'm going to try and go through as many of these books as I can while still retaining my usual in-depth reviews and it shouldn't, it should be okay-ish because one is in a long-running series, another one I'm planning on doing a full review for, that kind of thing. Oh, and one book I already um, wrapped up at the end of August. So that all helps, but if you're in the mood, grab a cup of tea or coffee or whatever your cuppa is, and let's get right into it. First up is Exposed by Kristen Callahan. This is a fairly new release, book four in her VIP series. I didn't even realize this was coming out until I saw other people reading it because she's taking her time with this series, but it was worth the wait for Brenna and Rye's story. The series revolves around a rock band. They are very popular now, grow more popular over the course of the series, but with flashbacks and stories about their previous life, we see what it was like as they were coming up as a band, all the troubles and everything they faced, and little emphasis on troubles because this is pretty angsty. This whole series has more angst than my usual, but I still like it because of the characters and the heat that Callahan brings. And anyway, I should probably tell you what this one is about. Brenda and Rye, Rye's the um, bassist of the band, they have been always the kind of people that kind of snipe at each other all the time, mostly in good humor, but they it seems like they always get on each other's nerves. And it turns out that there is an underlying sexual tension there. There were some missteps back there when the band was first coming together and they haven't been able to overcome them. And uh, they're both at a point where they're like, we just want more human contact, don't want a relationship, just want some sex. That would be great. So they decide to do that with each other and of course feelings get in the way. The other members of the band play a big role in this, not only because they're fellow band members, but they're a super deep, strong friendship group. And we have three heroines from other books that have come into the fold. And that's part of the reason why Brenna and Rye are feeling a little bit like left out because they're like, well, we're sitting here without any partners of any kind. This is the kind of stinks. Oh, and I should mention while I remember, Brenna is bi and uh, that comes up. It's very small, but it's in there. I read the first quarter or third of this incredibly quickly because it's falling into the same characters. The sexual tension and the heat is incredibly well done, and we're dealing with messy characters. And this is a distinction um, a friend of one of my book clubs made that really strikes a chord with me. Like, I can do messy people no problem. And there's definitely a messy relationship and like all of the baggage that they're bringing into unpacking all of that. I'm here for it. What I'm not a fan of is messy situations. And we have some of that going back, like visiting a family member's house when you don't get along with that family member. And something that bothered me about this, and this has come up as a theme in the beginning of my September reading, is I want the idea of family being an obligation to be challenged, if it deserves to be challenged. And here I think it does because one of the characters has an awful relationship with their parents. And you don't have to have a relationship with your parents as an adult if you don't want to. Family is a privilege, it's not an obligation. And I really wanted her to at least somebody to give her that option to say, you know you don't have to talk to him anymore. You know that every time you see them they make you feel awful. You don't have to deal with that. But nobody says that, and that annoyed me. Oh, and how could I forget inaccurate description of an illness? Urgh. Because the one, somebody has tendonitis and it's described as making their hand turn into a claw that like needs to be loosened up with heat and like a warm bath. That's not tendonitis. Ten I have tendonitis. That is a dull ache and it can suck but it doesn't make your hand turn into a claw. That, no. And we see the symptoms first before we hear the diagnosis. And I was racking my brain thinking flick to be, and they're like, oh, it's 10 days. I'm like, no, it's not. No, it's not. So anyway, that was another point off it. And yeah, so I ended up giving this like three stars. Great for some people, a little bit too much angst for me. And Please describe it nice correctly. Then I continued on my Erica Ridley kick by reading The Lord of Chance. Now this is the first book in her Rogues to Riches series. 
I had read the seventh book, Lord of the Masquerade, recently, which was great, stood alone just fine, but I wanted to go back to the beginning and see where everything started. And it's also a look at Ridley earlier in her writing career. This is a Regency. We're following Charlotte and Anthony. And Anthony is a ne'er-do-well. He's just respectable enough to get into the gambling halls, which is fine by him because that's how he's making his income and helping supporting his family through his gambling winnings, which, you know, is fine when it works, but it doesn't always work. And lately, things have been bad. He's actually gone all the way up to Scotland because he's not welcome at the parlors where he has debts now and he's just trying to get that money back. And um, yeah, his debtors come and find him and say, we need that within a week or else we will, no, two weeks, or we will send you into debtor's prison and basically you're never gonna get out of there, so not good. Charlotte is up in Scotland because she believes her father is there. She never knew her father. She's the daughter of a courtesan actually so she has no connection and wants to so she's up there searching for him any way she knows how these two end up meeting end up running into a peculiarity of scottish law and they end up being married an inconvenience it's a marriage of inconvenience they didn't want this and now they have to deal with the consequences because she has some money she has some family jewels basically and now that they're married that belongs to her husband which means that they would go towards his debt and he doesn't want that this is not his ideal situation. It's not her ideal situation. It's how they get through all this together. So the premise is good. The writing is fine. The characters are fine in the sense of who they are, but their emotional arcs are jumbled in a way that I don't think Ridley would do today. This is what I mean by it feels kind of like one of her earlier works because like Charlotte, she wants to rise above her station, station as the child of a prostitute and she wants to meet her father and that ends up in a way that felt a little bit too pat, a little bit too easy, kind of weird. And then Anthony, he's a compulsive gambler and we're in his head for part of that, just so you know, that's a content note. And so he's trying to come over that. He's trying to pay back his debt in time so he's not thrown into jail. Plus he has a complicated relationship with his family. And it didn't dovetail together as well as it could have. And frankly, I think there was a bit too much there. If you lost one or two of those side elements, it would have helped a bunch. So overall, I mean, I enjoyed the read. I liked it. I'm glad to see how Ridley has improved over the years. And it's a reminder that authors are not static. They change and grow over time. And it's worth revisiting people where maybe I thought their first book was fine. Nothing wrong with it, but just fine. And seeing where, how far they've come in the past few years, it can be completely worth it. With Ridley, I'm doing it in reverse, but this is my reminder that I can do it going forward. Then staying on theme, I finished The Governess Gambit by Erica Ridley. This is book 0.5 in her Wild Winchester series. And what I found so masterful about this is how it interacts and works as a 0.5, because I started the series with book one, which is The Duke Heist. And there are some events that we know happened in the past and we're dealing with, with the consequences of now in the beginning of that book. And that worked great. It was a good introduction. It, you know, learned all the characters. It was wonderful. I really liked that book. Here though, and you could read them in either order, either one first, we see what happened before that event that set off everything going on in book one. And it's not a romance in itself in that we don't have two main characters that are in the process of coming together here. This is more of a, a heist a romp. The Wild Winchester is doing what they do. They have a client that needs help to bring justice to the world and they do it. And it is fun. I learned more about the characters. Saw a character that I wasn't expecting to see and it was good and just so impressed that you could read this before the Duke heist and it would work great. And you could also read after the Duke heist and also works great. So she has it appears novellas in between each book of this series. And the one that's the 1.5 is the um, rake mistake, which I am super excited to get to now. And I'm going to leave that there for now because the series is coming back in a minute. Then I finished The Flame and the Flower by Kathleen E. Woodowis. I read this with Cynthia over at Book Whimsy and Alba over at Sariella, and they're both saints for reading this with me because it is infuriating. It is a romance. It's considered the first modern romance. It came out in 1972 and it started off this entire trend of higher heat historicals with helpless heroines that sometimes the hero is the one that puts her in an awful situation, but he's also the one that rescues her from it. There's a whole idea of the hero as both villain and hero, and it's the heroine's job to kind of slay the villain while keeping the hero intact. And I know all of this 
logically in my brain because I've been doing a lot of reading about romance. I have some um, like reading the romance by Radway and other stuff about old schools here. This doesn't succeed at it. This is awful because we have a woman who is just barely a woman. She's like a few months before her, no, one month before her 18th birthday. This is um, around 1800 in England. She ends up being taken on a ship and raped by the captain several times and all kinds of trigger warnings for abuse and rape and all that stuff in here and ends up with a child and ends up having like is forced to marry him and go back to America with him where he has a plantation, you know, like you do. This is awful. And one of the reasons I feel like I can say that when normally I try not to say that about books, right? I try not to try and put in perspective. And especially for something this old, I was hoping to be able to say, oh, for its time, like, I don't like it. But 50 years ago, this made a lot of sense. This did not even make sense 50 years ago, I'm pretty sure. Because there's no hope in it for this woman. She's merely trying to survive being in this awful relationship. And we're reminded of the rape up until the very, like, two or three pages from the end, they bring up the rape again. Whereas even in books that came after this, there would be a lot more gray areas. They try and gloss over some things. This doesn't even try. There's awful stereotypes of, um, it's kind of of enslaved folks. So for some reason, they're not enslaved. Like he's a plantation and it's all servants, which is just weird. And so I had a lot of thoughts about this. 95% of them ranty and they're all in a vlog. So if that hasn't gone up yet, it will be going up soon. And um, yeah, so many, many thanks to Alba and Cynthia for reading this with me. I still want to read some other old schools, but um, it's kind of nice to know that I've read the worst one probably, that things can only go up from here. So after that, I needed something fun, something completely, utterly different and preferably short. So I picked up Quarantine Alien Bees by Robin Lovett. This is the third book in her series that's about a world where they had a worse pandemic than the one we have now. Like 50% of the world was killed on the first wave and the government collapsed and now it's all like thugs with drones and they shoot at you if they don't like you and it's just awful awful stuff. Most people are living alone because if you happen to be with somebody else, that's what activates this particular virus and you end up dying in three days. Awful world, but we have love in it. Here's the thing with this book compared to the other ones, because all of them have an alien that gets matched up to a human because they're fated mates and the exchange of DNA helps each one in a different way. The human gets antibodies from this awful virus and the alien gets, um, they're having genetic defects and by swapping DNA, it helps fix all of those. So mutually good. The hero for this one is in a cage, literally, and has been for years because he's dangerous and he has hurt people. And the only way they can keep him manageable is in a cage. And I was not too happy with that at the beginning, but they acknowledge how awful it is that he's, he's in a cage. He gets released sort of pretty quickly. The focus of this book feels a little different because the first ones were more about the sex and were more about the exchange of fluids and that's how you get the antibodies and like vibrating body parts and the over the top stuff is what kind of made those books what they are, which was over the top fun. This one is a little bit more restrained we are dealing with this beast character, but his mind comes back pretty quickly, thank goodness. And it's fascinating how this book speaks to our own current moment in the pandemic. Like you can see exactly when she was writing this, it was when Delta variant was becoming a thing and how everybody, especially in the US, places where the um, vaccine is readily available, which is not the whole world, let's remember the global south here. But people thought that once they had the vaccine, they could go back to quote unquote normal life and that ended up not being the case and the disappointment in that. And how do you reckon that? Because even in this book, they thought if we do X, Y, Z, then you're immune for life. And guess what? Turns out you're not. Turns out there can be breakthrough infections and complications that, and so like in that way, it really spoke to the current moment in a way that was almost a balm, which feels weird when you look at this cover and you think about the beast alien romance thing but it worked really well. This is my favorite of the whole series so far. I think because it got away from the weird and went for the heart. And yeah, and so these are designed to all read alone. I don't know if I would recommend that.
why I liked having the background knowledge from the previous books, but if the previous ones didn't interest you, but you would still like to try the series, this would be the one. And I'm super, super interested in the next one because it has an invisible character. <laughs> like his genetic defect is that he can no longer be seen. So I'm super curious for that out in January, I think. Then I finished A Lot Like Adios by Alexis Daria. This is a brand new release and uh, I got a review copy from Avon. Thank you so much. I loved the first book of this series. You had me at Ola and I knew I had to pick up the second and I really like this one a lot. So many things are good. This is all the reasons why I love Daria's work. But uh, recurring theme, a little bit too much angst for me to be completely comfortable with in situations. First, the premise, we have Michelle, who often goes as Mish, and Gabe. They were friends growing up all through high school. But then Gabe, all of a sudden, went off to the West Coast to go to university, leaving her feeling abandoned and just kind of, they've not been in contact very much since then. Gabe had some really good reasons to go out West and actually did not communicate with his family, which, and that ended up including Michelle. He just cut himself off and did his own thing. He started a gym that concentrates on mobility and flexibility. It's really cool. And cause he's a physical therapist and so that's the angle he's coming at it from. And he has a partner, there's investors and they want to open a gym on the East Coast. So he ends up going back to New York for the first time in years and years to work with Michelle who ends up has turned into a really good marketer and his partner has said we should hook up, we should like hire her to do our marketing campaign and he's like, well, I know her, but sure, we can do a business relationship. And then they finally get together and all of those nascent, like, because they really liked each other in high school, all those sparks begin to fly again. The writing is great. I love the characters. I love the little glimpses of characters from the first book that we see. Uh, there's mixed families of Puerto Rican and Mexican heritage. I love, one of my favorite things about this is the code switching because Daria is awesome in that she doesn't have the uh, Spanish italicized. And in all the other books I think I've seen in fiction to some large extent, if there's any code switching, which is changing between languages, it's usually sentence by sentence or even paragraph by paragraph. She does sentences that are mixed English and Spanish, which in my experience as a bilingual person is the way bilingual people actually speak when there's people that know both languages. Loved seeing that. Haven't seen that anywhere else. Both Mish and Gabe are bi and they didn't realize that until after high school. So when they're meeting again, she's one of them casually mentions, oh yeah, I'm bi. It's like, no shit, me too. Hey, who would have thought it? And they mentioned that's because they didn't have any bi people in their life when they were younger, that it didn't really come on their radar as a possibility. It was only after they left that they were able to figure all that out. That was super cool. Also, Mish takes a low dose anxiety drug every day to stay on balance. And that's very low key mental health rep. So I love the characters. I love Daria's writing. The sex scenes are incredibly hot. I like them better than the ones in You Had Me Dola, in fact. And so much good stuff here, but I'm gonna get back on a couple of themes. It was a little bit too angsty for what I was in the mood for at the time. I'm not holding that against this book. It's just wasn't quite what I was looking for at that moment. And that kind of hurts because I can see how good it is. I can intellectually grok how all these pieces come together. It's just not for me. Gabe has been estranged from his parents and this comes out in the very beginning for nine years. And Mish has just brought him next door to said parents without their knowledge and he's freaking out. And he's like, I haven't seen my dad in nine years. I haven't talked to my dad in nine years and I have reasons. And she just blithely he's like, whatever, go in the back door, they won't see you. And I, that annoyed me. I wonder if a hero could get away with that the way that this heroine gets away with that. I just want a recognition that again, if people are awful to you, you don't have to be in contact with them if you don't want to. If it's better for your own being, like your mental health and just in general to not be in contact with them, that's fine. It's just trampled right over. So while I gave this book like three and a half stars, it will be a five star book for other people. And that's wonderful. And I love Daria and I can't wait to go on to the next book in this series. It's just unfortunate that time and circumstance didn't work out to this being my new favorite. This video is long, isn't it? Only two books left and they're gonna be on the shorter side. Next is Conspirator by CJ Cherry. This is the 10th book in her Foreigner series that I'm reading with Rachel over at Colinati. And the beginning of this book was kind of annoying because like, oh, we're doing the same old thing again, huh? It's gonna be that again. And obviously I'm staying very, very vague because spoilers, it's book 10 in a series. So yeah, that beginning, the kind of disappointed, but read on and wow, everything comes together 
by the end. We have more politics. We're seeing sides of Bren, who's an interpreter slash diplomat, that we haven't seen before. We're seeing him in different places, different situations, and new politics have come into the works to the extent that while the last few books haven't had any maps, this one does in the back, as well as some uh, notes from Bren Cameron's notebook about new um, political information and alliances and things we need to know. Cherry builds out her worlds and it shows. She has this solid in her head, which makes the story come together so well. And on top of that, as always, her grasp of psychology and how different characters with different personalities would act in different situations is masterful. Because even if somebody does something where you go, wait, 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 what? When you think it through, and sometimes with little hints from Cherry about why you realize it and it makes complete sense all over again. So while the beginning wasn't bad, but I was like, oh great, the end pulled this up to four stars easily. And it's a book that's setting up this trilogy because the entire series is in trilogy. So 10, 11, 12, hopefully will be its own arc. And I am so curious to see where this goes. And the last book I'm going to talk about today is The Perks of Loving a Wallflower by Erica Ridley. It comes October 26th from forever. Thank you so much for the advanced copy because I love this book so much and we'll be yelling about it and how awesome it is for quite a while, I'm sure. So I'm going to keep this short now and you can look forward to a full review, hopefully in about a month's time. This is a female non-binary sapphic romance in the Regency that doesn't overlook the difficulties of being in a sapphic relationship at that time. We have one character who wants to be the protagonist of her own story that has had her life micromanaged by her parents and would like to break free but doesn't quite know how. We have another character who is a master of disguise, who feels just as comfortable in men's clothes as women's clothes, who describes themselves as being both those genders and also neither of those genders. And she just wants to be, and she uses she, her pronouns, she just wants to be loved for herself and not for the people that she ends up looking like when she's wearing these disguises. We have found family. We have the power of familial love as well as romantic love. We have fun. There's a caper. There's a thing that needs to be stolen and gotten back in order to figure out a puzzle. And the Winchesters themselves are awesome. Hilarious moments through here as well as earnest ones with the characters making me think about like what like what you really want in a relationship when you find a partner how you want them to understand you as a person and to honor that person and to not put up with somebody who won't honor you as you are so good so that's in very broad strokes what's about so if you are interested at all the duke heist is already out you can read that you've already seen my review for the governess gambit back there so so good Look forward to that full review in October. So there we have it, the books that I've read so far in September. I would love to hear your thoughts on any of these. How is your September going? Let me know down in the con contents down below, in the comments down below. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.